Uh, I think that um, I think that's uh, partly I was answering it in that question. I think that each role has certain role characteristics in it that, in a way, are part of the playing field game. Like if you look at a game of sports, like you watch basketball or you watch baseball, you can see that there are certain ways the elbow can be used in basketball that are right on the edge of legal or not. And everybody knows that, and that's sort of part of the way the game is played. It's a hard, hockey's a very hard game in which the rules of it. There are rules in, like I remember in Boston, that we had a mayor, Mayor Curley. Mayor Curley was a, um, a real gunnuff. He was a real, um, well, he, was, uh, he used patronage a lot. Everybody loved Mayor Curley, but he was, he was sent to jail for mail fraud. And when he came, the city loved him so much, they kept him on as mayor. And when he came out, they all went to South Station when the train, and they took him on his shoulders back to City Hall. And I was offended by this. And in later years, when I was talking to my friend, Timothy Leary, about this, he said, why are you offended? You just didn't understand the rules of the game. That in the game, everybody understood the rules, and the rules were serving the people. They were just not serving them by your statement of how the game should be played. But the game was being played, and it was relatively fair to everybody, as fair as any other system was. It was just not the game you understood. I think that in law, one understands that you are to represent the client. For example, there's a very delicate issue in law of representing somebody that may likely be guilty of a crime because they have a right to a, a, they have a, right to a defense. And the question is, can the lawyer know the person is guilty and still defend them or not? Now, you, there are many lawyers that defend clients that they know they're guilty but feel that they have a right to a fair trial and they will use whatever guile they have as a lawyer to give that person as best a trial as they can even though they may know that person's guilty. And uh, we know the system works that way. And when you enter that role, you enter the role knowing the system works that way. Now. Where you are in relation to your role is where we're, what we're talking about. That if you are, I am a lawyer, you're trapped. If I am a being, being a lawyer, then you see the rules of the playing field. You put on your spikes to go on the football field. You pick up your tennis sneakers to go on the tennis court. You understand the rules of it and you play it. And you can play the rules in such a way that your relationship with your client, with your opponent, with the opposing lawyer, with the judge, with, um, with the prosecuting attorney, with everybody, can be such that even in opposition, you get closer to the other person. And you feed the spirit even when you oppose and use all the rule, all the techniques that are within the armamentarium of the lawyer, law profession. You hear what I'm saying? It's your identification with the guile that creates the distance. It's interesting how you play, like when you play Monopoly, if you play the game Monopoly, which is a board game in which there are thimbles and hats and irons, and you pick a thimble, a symbol, and you move it around the board, and you go to jail, or you win Park Place, or the utilities, and so on. If you and I play Monopoly together, the game requires we play fiercely that we compete. But you and I collaborated to sit down and play the game. We are collaborators to compete. Do you hear that? So we're at two levels simultaneously. At the level of competition, I am the thimble and you are the top hat. Right? At the level of collaboration, we're two friends that said, you want to play Monopoly? All right? When you lose that level, the competition is divisive. When you're just the hat of the thimble. When you lose the level of competition and you're just two friends playing together but you don't play fiercely, you don't get the game. You don't get the juice out of the game. The game doesn't work. 
The game is based on the fact that there's competition. So that what you're hearing is, and what we're playing with is simultaneously living on more than one level of consciousness at the same moment. So that you say to somebody, we came together to fall into love. You say to the prosecuting attorney. You don't say it to him, by the way. <laughs> but you say, we came together to fall into love. And the form we're going to fall into love is to fight over this case. And I'm going to use every technique, and you're going to use every technique. But I don't forget that you're a soul who's using your techniques, and I'm a soul who's using my techniques. And we're both coming from the same place. And when we get finished, it's the same thing as Gandhi said, I want the English to leave, but I want them to leave as friends. And the English could handle that because of they had some kind of consciousness about that, and it worked. It worked. There was a way in which they got closer through the divisiveness. It's an art form. You know? But uh, see, it's interesting because the lie itself isn't what it is. It's whether you're the liar. That's the thing that's hard to hear. Truth is the truth of the spirit. Truth isn't necessarily the truth of the words. Truth is the quality of the spirit. I mean, I, I, it's a really hard one because most of us can't afford the lie because we're so identified with being the liar. You'd have to be totally non-identified with a lie to lie. It's like the way Maharaji could say, Jao, go away, in a way that turned out to be the caress of love. It's the way in which you're living on many levels and you're sending the message of one level through the forms of another. That's the art form. It's the art form of life that I can understand. Okay. Who's next? Um, my lack of trust in how to just be and how to let go of constantly reaching out to touch people, to give to people. Are you there? Because if they respond warmly, I am here. Mm. And my fear, if I don't reach out, I won't be here. Very interesting. Um, the, um, on the journey of becoming somebody, having a name, an identity, and a place, we feared the cracks in that where we weren't somebody. We feared the nobodiness. And then when we turn around and start to become nobody, <clears throat> All of our old fears of not being something come up again. I watched myself um, um, shift my inner experiences about myself from feeling like I had a strong persona that was outward and inward, where I was sitting in my somebodyness all the time, and I watched it start to dissolve, and my confusion, because I hadn't dealt with the world without that, and... I remember now, as I look back, the flickery period during which it was, I felt very vulnerable in my nobodiness, in nothing, and not knowing where I was or who I was or what I was, that I didn't feel safe in that structure any longer. And I noticed that when I 
like some, I'd be giving an interview for a newspaper or a magazine, and somebody would say, do you have a message for our readers? And I'd listen, and I'd say, no, I don't. <laughs> and uh, they weren't used to that, because everybody has a message. I mean, I could talk till, uh, you can see, I can talk indefinitely, and I've got... But in terms of me, I don't have a message. In a sense, that's a somebody thing that is just not what I, it's about any longer. And as people said, like, who are you? Well, they call it and they say, what's been happening? <laughs> now, there's so many levels. Which one do they want? Or they say, where do you live? I say, on earth. They say, that's not what I mean. Or who are you? I think I didn't even notice the way it was dissolving, that kind of solidity of somebodyness was dissolving, except the way people kept, when people acted in a way that expected me to be solid, and I wasn't. And then I began to get a sense of this thing happening, and at first I felt easy because I had come out of a value where to be chameleon-like, you know, where you're changing your colors to every situation, is somehow a sign of weakness. And I had to flip it around where I started to experience that as a sign of strength. That I didn't have to be somebody, I could be open to... That more and more I had no idea who I am, what I'm doing here, where I'm going, I can give you models, metaphors, you know, I can do that very, very charmingly and very well, and then I can go in and out of them. But they're all ones to loosen the ones you've got, to, so we will all end up together with none of them. It's the same thing about the thorn. And I think that the confusion is feeling that you have to come into a situation with a somebodyness that you then have to get everybody to reassure you that's it in order to feel safe in the situation. And I find now more and more I can walk into a situation, walk up to somebody and have no idea who I am or what I'm doing there and allow their minds to define my reality without getting caught in it. See their mind define the reality. If that reality is one that's destructive, it won't, won't feel harmonious, and I, I trust. It had to do with trust in the inner connection to truth. And I think that that transformation is a very flickery process, very flickery process. I think you just let yourself in. It's like letting yourself into a very hot bath. You go in by little degrees of playing with the idea that you just don't know. Stephen Levine talks about don't knowness. I think he got it from Sun Sin. Sun Sun what's his name? Sun, Sun Sen, the Zen master, who just said, "Practice, don't know." I don't know. I don't know. Now, to go from that world of social existence where you're constantly looking in other people's eyes to say, am I existing? Am I good enough? Am I what you want? Am I all right? Am I here? So like at this moment, there's the wind and the trees. And at that moment, when I heard the wind and the trees, I disappeared and there was just the wind and the trees. And then a moment later, this situation brought back me talking to you. And I realized that for years I could never do that. I couldn't just allow the wind and the trees to exist because I was afraid of the loss of continuity. I was afraid of allowing the moment to be just what it was for fear I wouldn't be appropriate to the situation.
See, there are stages of this process of transformation. There is a stage where you feel something in you that is behind your social facade and your social relationships to people. You feel a, a, a somebodyness, which we call soul. It's like you feel an, an entity. Then as you get deeper into the, into the transformative work, that thing starts to dissolve. That's what anatta is about. There's no self. There's no one. Then you just see that there are just processes going on. There's nobody there. There's just these processes going on. And then the question is, how do you incorporate that understanding into existence? How do you live with no continuity? The continuity is the result of karma. It's the result that who you were started an inertial process that leads to you to be this person. But as your awareness is less attached to that, you're just aware of processes. Just as I'm aware of my body aging and decaying, I'm aware of my awareness getting lighter and less attached to my forms, I'm aware of personality processes, old ones running off, I'm aware that when somebody comes up to me that is a strong symbol of this or a uh, somebody that awakens this desire, the desire will arise or the reaction will awaken. But I can see it now almost in slow motion as just processes going on. And all I end up being is just these processes. All the form of me ends up being is just these processes. And behind it all, they're just as... You see, not somebody being aware, there's just awareness, which is even subtler See, there's nobody, there's nobody here. There isn't anybody here. And it's so interesting because we so little can handle even imagining there's nobody in there. We keep projecting our own solidity into everybody else. So it's very hard for me to convey to you the kind of nothingness that's going on in here. And say to you that you just keep delicately approaching it and just playing with watching the way in which you need that reassurance and watching that need and seeing that need is just a phenomenon that exists in the universe lawfully existing and keep quieting the mind and deepening the connection to just that part of you that just is with it all just the spacious awareness it's called spacious awareness it's the sky. It's just the sky. I was just trying to convey that, that delicate transformative period, which is confusing and frightening and all of it. Yeah. Questions? I have uh, noticed that as, as I've progressed on this pathway, that I've picked up a lot of rules and regulations. And in that picking up of rules and regulations of should and shouldn't, that who's taken the brunt of that in myself is this thing called the personality. And this personality for me has become like a whipping post, my inner tyrant. And so what I wanted to ask you was, how can this personality, being that this is an aspect of self, be a vehicle for us, a beauty, something to be endeared with and worked with rather than the experience of constant obstacle. As, as the, what we've been talking about, the witness or the spacious awareness around gets more real, as you start to acknowledge a plane of consciousness around the plane in which the personality is real. Give a space around it. That perspective allows you the space to appreciate the beauty of the personality and to delight in it. In which, at which point the personality becomes a, just like a flower, or just like a tree. I mean, it's something so preciously beautiful because it's a form of nature. 
It's a form that it's coming out of all kinds of socialization processes. It's coming out of experiences. It's a quality of the way in which emotion and intellect and body and all these things come together. It's the, it's the dance of the interrelationship of forms with each other, all the relationship stuff that is involved with personality. It all turns extremely beautiful when you have a perspective about it. It's only when you are locked into a total identification with it, with no space around it, that it starts to become a tyrannical master and a kind of an imprisoning concept. So the spiritual practice is just one of giving you a more spacious perspective to balance the identification with the personality and so that you're going in and out of it. And they talk about the issue. It's very delicate to deal with the issue of attachment, which we will be in another group this morning, about the relation of involvement to attachment. Because ultimately, you are fully involved in your personality. I mean, I am fully charming. I really am. I'm a really charming person, and I'm a warm person, and I'm a good person. I am all those things. And I'm an intelligent person, and I'm an interesting person, and I'm a caring person. That's all personality stuff. And partly why I am more of that all the time is because I am less of it all the time from inside. And so it's more of a delight. And where it doesn't work, it keeps falling away because I'm not so invested in being it all the time. Can you hear the issue? Yeah, and I was about to want to ask you, is spirit warm and charming? And is the person spirit has no like form to it. Spirit isn't warm and charming. Spirit has no form to it. Spirit infuses forms. Spirit can be harsh and tyrannical, although most of us are scared of it. I mean, that's what the Old Testament is about, and it's too scary for most people because they're so busy in their personality feeling judged. But a Shiva, which we were singing to the other night, destroys. He destroys. He, he creates chaos. And that also is spirit. And in the systems where you understand the tripartite nature of the one, in, like in Hinduism, where you have Brahma, which creates, Vishnu, which preserves, and Shiva, which brings, re breaks it all down and brings it back into nothing, those are all different aspects of spirit. And you can see that a, a, a lightning storm is as much spirit as uh, the new flower. So, no, it isn't all gentle and sweet at all. And you can't figure what personality. Some of the most masters, I mean, in Tibetan tradition, there's a lot of like uh, uh, Tilopa, Naropa, all that. There's a lot of Marpa. There's a lot of stories about tyrannical masters. You know, build a house, now tear it down. Now build another house, now tear it down. You're an asshole. You don't know what you're doing. And then turning to another master and say, coming along well, you know, that student. And uh, because the dynamics between student and teacher, when the, student, the teacher loves the student enough, the teacher can use that sword. And sometimes that sword is very fierce. From the student's point of view, the sword feels like it's cutting. What it's cutting is cutting that which needs to be cut for the light to come through. But only a master that loves enough can do that. Questions? group was gracious enough to let me have the ego question. Um, what I was wondering if, is if you can talk a little bit about distinguishing between healthy independence, like your refusal to go to medical school, and an egoism that would be an obstacle to personal growth. Well, um, Let's first just define the term a little bit. The term ego, the way I'm, uh, I would work with it, is a structure of mind that organizes the universe, particularly around the relationship of the separateness. It's in the domain of separateness. It is the steering mechanism for you as a separate entity. And when you, the other part of you, it's like there are two mechanisms going in you, and you could equate them to the head and the heart at one level, although that's a little shoddy, as we'll talk later in integration. But at one level, at the intellect, where the, or the 
the conceptual structures of mind, there it is a mechanism, it's a steering mechanism for keeping you as a separate entity surviving and functioning within the unit, within this world, with, on this plane. And um, then there's the other part of you, the Atman, the Jivatman, the, the heart, the intuitive wisdom, whatever that is, that merges, that goes out and balances and flows and what gives away everything and doesn't care and it's like the lilies in the field and uh, that, that level of place. The, uh, the kind of unconditional lover. Um, and these are two things that, and there's, as we'll talk in integration, there's a tension between those two things. Now, when you develop the ego structure, this, this mechanism, this central, computer central for running the game, um, the question arises as to how attached you are or how identified you are with it. Like, you don't, in spiritual ev evolution, you don't destroy the ego you merely turn it from being from identifying with it to having it as a functional unit. You still need it as a functional unit so that I, when I'm talking to you, I realize there's a you and a me and I'm talking to you on this plane. I've also got to have my heart open so that another plane, I'm just talking to myself. Right? These are two planes of reality because it's God talking to itself. So when I have this ego structure for orienting me and functioning on this plane, it is going to be functional when I'm not identified with it. When I have it as, uh, I think uh, Vivekananda said, the, uh, he, he was talking about the intellect, but you could say the ego, because that's part of that structure, conceptual structure, that the ego is a lousy master, but a wonderful servant. See? And the art is to convert it into being a servant. The ego says, I mean, in the image of, uh, the original image of, uh, uh, I guess, Ramakrishna, he's talking about a horse-drawn carriage, and the coachman is sitting up on top, and the horses are the desires, and the coachman is the ego, and the coachman thinks he's handling the whole thing. And then at one point, he's been doing it for so long, he thinks he's running the show, and then at some point, the man inside the carriage, the woman inside the carriage, taps on the glass and says, turn left here. And the coachman says, who the hell are you? Or, you know, who are you to tell me? Well, what are you doing in there? And this is the higher self that is awakening. And the higher self says, I own the carriage and you're my servant. And the ego says, the hell you are. Like I'm running this show. You need me to survive. You got to remember the ego. This is uh, in the fear love dichotomy. The ego is built on fear. It's not built on love, it's built on fear. It's built on the fear of non-survival. And so you build a structure in order to make you safe. And it's a beautiful instrument, but if you're identified with it, you are fearful all the time. And because you're fearful, you're always going to overcompensate and make ego decisions that are a little inappropriate, that are a little inappropriate, because they'll be colored by your looking from inside this place. When you're outside of it, you see you use your ego as you need to to make decisions. You come back into somebodyness, but you're not. Like, like part of what, I mean, I go in and out of it. Like if I, the other night when I was tired and my mind wasn't clear, by the end of the evening, I was in my ego. And I said to you, I'm sorry, I'm fatigued. And I felt depressed and I felt bad. That was ego. When I come up out of that, what you like about me is that I have a charming ego, but you're not just stuck with my charisma. That you're feeling something behind it because there is something behind it because I'm back here. And you and I are meeting back here behind this dance that we're doing, which is charming and fascinating. And that's really the, the beauty of playing with the ego and the higher consciousness. And it's only when those two planes work that the ego becomes really functional. Okay? Okay, next. Now, uh, how do I know while I'm doing what I'm doing that I'm doing it as part of my life business, as doing my bit as part of the whole, and that I'm not on a disguised ego trip? Did you all hear that? Yes? Mm -hmm. 
how does one know when one is doing what one is doing, that one is doing it from the level of uh, evolving consciousness and not just doing it as an ego trip, as a trip of maintaining one's separateness? Um, until the final moment before enlightenment, I can guarantee that everything is an ego trip. Okay? <laughs> all right? I mean, all your spiritual practices, they're all ego trips. It's all ego trip because it's you, it's you being somebody thinking you're doing something. That's an ego trip. And you're in nobody training, but until you become nobody, you're still somebody doing it. And somebody never gets through the door of enlightenment. You see, who you think you are never gets enlightened. You can go right up to the door, but then you've got to go for it to happen, all right? So, so you're in this funny predicament that it's all ego trip. I mean, it's all somebody doing something. It gets subtle. It gets so subtle. But it is still ego. There's always ego right till the very end. And until there's nobody home. And when there's nobody home, you wouldn't ask the question. So, <laughs> so we all relax and we just keep quieting and calming and observing and witnessing and keep aiming and correcting and cleaning up and letting go and opening again and coming back and just keep quieting and deepening, opening the heart, quieting the mind, all the practices we'll be talking about this week. And uh, the ego gets subtler and subtler, and it gets more obvious to the quiet mind how it's working. And you become a connoisseur and an appreciator of your own ego. You just delight in how exquisitely beautiful it is. How it, I mean, it's like um, God and the devil walking down the street and they see a shiny object and God picks it up and he says, ah, truth. And Satan says, here, give it to me, I'll organize it. And it's sort of the same thing, that the spirit, the soul, comes to a moment of truth, and the minute you're going, oh, how wonderful, the ego says, doing pretty well, you know? <laughs> See? Now you should teach, you know, something like that. It's great, you know? And you watch how it works. It's so exquisite. Uh, you know, I must be very holy. You can feel those little things happening along the way, you know? Hello. Um, I keep hearing all the time, listening to your intuitive heart or your intuitive self. And lots of times the intuitive part for me is not even my mind getting in the way, and I just know. But then sometimes when I have stuff, when I have a question or something I want clarity on, I talk to the spiritual part or the intuitive part of me. And then my mind comes in and says, how do you know? That's too positive. Mm -hmm. um, you may make a mistake. And I want to know how do you really know that it's spirit? Because sometimes I don't get that love, gut, intuitive feeling. My mind comes in there and wants yep. to analyze it. And I'm yep. afraid to make a mistake. Got it. And your last line, your throwaway line at the end was very profound. I'm afraid to make a mistake. Um, Aurobindo said that the path to enlightenment is the path of taking a step, falling on your face, getting up, brushing yourself off, looking sheepishly at God, taking another step, falling on your face, getting up, brushing yourself off, looking sheepishly at God, that if you knew the root already, you would be the root. So that you can't be afraid of error. I mean, I have made a public... Um, <laughs> ass of myself, if you will. I mean, I published that chapter called Egg on My Beard uh, a few years ago. And what I do is the minute I fall on my face, I publicly acclaim it uh, because I realize that that helps other people being willing to risk uh, in, in spiritual work. There are so many inner voices inside each of us and each one is saying, I am the deepest truth, listen to me. Your emotional needs are saying, I'm real, you must satisfy me. Your intellectual analysis, well, I don't know about that. And, and I'm the final decision maker. 
And every part of you, my body is saying, I'm tired. You don't think you can really do that, do you? And each part of us has got its own hierarchical system that is calling the shots. And the intuitive voice is what's called in the Quaker tradition, the still small voice within. Because the senses and the thinking mind are like these trumpets that are always blaring. And they have something to say about everything. And to hear that little voice is a very delicate tuning. And that's part of what meditation's about, about learning, how, about reading tracks that resonate with that place inside. And so you listen as best you can. And you then act when you have to act out of the best, the deepest you could hear, knowing full well that the ego in its exquisite, the mind, really, the mind in its exquisite desire to keep control will imitate anything. And it will say, if, if, if you feel the inner voice speaks in uh, soft and mellow tones, the ego will say, I am the truth, you know? I mean, you can count on the fact that it will always, and when you look, you will see that every spiritual journey you're on is an ego trip. The journey itself is an ego trip. It also has a truth in it. And the process is, as you keep doing it, the truth keeps deepening your connection and the ego tripness starts to keep changing and falling away. But to demand that any spiritual journey not have an ego component in it, not have a self-aggrandizing or self-securing or strengthening the separateness at the same time you're in it to merge. I don't dare use the word wedding anymore. <laughs> you hear the issue? Yeah. Okay. Next. Margaret. Oh, no. Um, <clears throat> this, this question, I think, in a general arena deals with uh, spiritual abuse. And... Uh, there's really, it's really a kind of a two-part question. The first part has to do with when do I know whether I'm copping out? When I start saying my beads and I should be dealing with some psychological stuff. How do I know? Can I get any sort of spiritual ascension without dealing with my psychological shit? That's question one. And the second part for me is related in terms of this is a professional question as I deal with clients who think they have achieved a certain level of spirituality and it just isn't the truth. What is my role as a, as a therapist or as a facilitator to say, hey, you know, you can't be talking Jesus and kicking your kids each day. So that's generally what I'm talking about. From um, personal experiences and from guiding and listening to many, many people over time, I've, um, I've seen the way in which the, um, the interplay between psychological and spiritual, such that um, a lot of the reasons people get into spiritual work are really psychologically uh, psychological reasons that have to do with avoidance, that have to do with a lot of denial. And when they try to build a house on sand that way, uh, there's a corruption in the whole process that ultimately ends up um, leaving them being in the spiritual journey in a way that has a top on it. They can only get so far and then they feel that they don't get any further. And at that point, a lot of them when they finally can allow it, realize that they have to work on their psychological space to get themselves cleared out, to come at their work from another point of view spiritually. So, um, and I've done that myself. I mean, I was in therapy, then I felt that therapy often can be a, a kind of a bottomless well because you don't necessarily solve all your problems, but you, you, you can solve some of the major obstacles or the harshest ones 
then you start to do spiritual practices and they force to the surface other psychodynamics which then can be skimmed therapeutically at a later time and then with that skimming is a way in which you can um, uh, come at the spiritual journey from another place so that there's this kind of spiraling process between psychodynamics and spiritual work um, it's um, There's an interesting question of how much psychological health is required for spiritual work. And my, my best evidence is not a hell of a lot. That, um, that if you look at the history of spiritual uh, saints and people that have been involved, their psychological makeup has been pretty off the wall. I mean, pretty bizarrely neurotic. So... Um, in an interesting way, from a karmic point of view, the neurosis drives the spirit often up to a certain point, and then it starts to get in the way. And it feels to me like there's no simple rule of, the, of thumb that you would say the person has to have worked through certain psychodynamics before they should go into spirituality. What is required is that the person have truth, that they understand that there is truth in the spiritual journey so that when they when they realize that there is fraudulence in the way they are doing it, that they are, that they're doing it in a way that is um, hiding or, or just um, self-aggrandizing in a way that isn't liberating, they can cop to it. And there's a lot of inertia because of the values the spiritual scene has about psychotherapy in the sense that it tends to reduce it, it's reductionistic. And that, I think, and I was part of that, by the way, for, for a long time, and I've come out of that now. I mean, and I myself have gone back into therapy and come out, and I mean, I've, I've realized the value of going back and forth, and a lot of my friends who are spiritual teachers have done the same thing. So, um, now, when a person feels the need for psychological, to clean out some stuff psychologically, who they go to is interesting because ideally you would go to somebody who themselves have strong spiritual perspective as well as psychological nachas and you know skills so that you would so that person wouldn't keep reducing all of the spiritual evolution because a, a, a psychotherapist who is only a psychotherapist will see it's like Freud saying spirituality is just um, it's just um, uh, you know, um, misconfected libido, you know, I mean, it's, and um, that all religion was that, and that's what Jung and Freud were fighting about, and uh, my sense is that you would go to somebody, if you could, that would be sympathetic to what you're, the, the deeper kinds of things you're working on besides psychological stuff. However, you can't always have that, and so then you go to the psychotherapist more as you would to go to somebody that would help you with a certain plane of reality in which you don't bring that other plane of reality to bear in the therapeutic situation because running it through that person's consciousness isn't going to help your spiritual work particularly because that person doesn't have that kind of consciousness. Now, just to finish your second question and then you can react. And the second question is what responsibility do we have with another person to... Um, if a person comes to you as a therapist, that is a certain license. And they're saying to you, I would like you to reflect back to me the way in which I am... my psychodynamics in the way in which I am distorting reality or I am misusing experiences or the way in which I'm hiding myself from the suffering I'm creating for myself and others. And that license gives you the license to say you're using your spiritual work as a cop-out. The thing that it has requires is that you yourself be so clear in those relationships within your own being that you can afford to say that to somebody where it's not somehow justifying your own situation. Okay, so that's response there. Basically, that, that would have responded to my question. 